Hey, Steven Yonder here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1988 Chevy Caprice Classic Estate. Now, 1988, we were well into the downsizing, front wheel drive, V6, transverse four, depressing era of automotive design and styling. Quite honestly, there were dark days. I mean, the cars sold well enough. They got good fuel economy. They were clean at the tailpipe. Some people, though, still had families and had to move them. Them, let alone pulling trailers. You go camping, you need something big with a full frame that'll pull that trailer. That's where the Chevy Impala and Caprice Classic wagons came into play. Now this is a full-size car, but keep in mind in 1977, the first year for this basic platform, Chevrolet downsized these things 20% versus 1976. And of course, the full-size Chevy was the first Chevrolet to be downsized in 78. The Malibu and the Monte Carlo got their turn at the downsizing axe. But for 77, the Impala and Caprice were the first downsized Chevys, but again, 10 years in, 11 years in, this 1988, and the process was still going strong. These things were built through 1990, and of course, another generation came after that. So these cars, as big as they were and are, they served a very necessary purpose. American families who, before the SUV thing kicked in, American wagons like this were in five out of 10 driveways. Now inside this one, we'll see some interesting stuff. And these always have bench seats up front. Nothing, no sporting aspirations on these at all. Uh, and again, bench seat, room for three in the front, three in the back, even a third row. So you could potentially have an eight passenger full-size car. And that's what you got right here. And again, these are full frame cars. And something about the wagons, uh, massive 11 inch drums at the back. And again, these are cast iron drums. They're not stamped steel. They're not aluminum, but with that said, big drum. And these little fins right here, these function to do two things when they're not rusting away and turning to nothing. Look at that, crazy. Look at that. <laughs> But anyway, cast iron, right? But these things dissipate heat as heat sinks, and also they stir up the airflow inside of the rim to help circulate the cooling air to cool the drum when you're descending the grapevine with that Airstream trailer behind you and all eight of you in the car. You don't get brake fade. Of course, disc brakes up front, which have been harvested here, but again, they do a great job of stopping the car. Now, paperwork in this one's kind of neat. We have a pretty thick dossier of service. We can see right here that uh, somebody took the car to Denoyer Chevrolet in Albany, New York. And back in, uh, what was this? What year? What time here? Quite a while back. There's no date. Anyway, uh, but they had work done. They had the distributor cap, the rotor done. And back in 1994, there you go. So the car was, uh, oh, I don't know, eight years old, something like that. I'm not a math major. Some receipts. But again, paperwork like this is pretty cool. It's fun to learn. Sometimes you find things like the uh, original window sticker, Dylan Chevrolet in Greenfield, Mass. We can see some work was done. Looks like, again, uh, plugs and an oil change, etc. cetera. Meineke mufflers, there we go, right there. Before the advent of stainless steel exhaust systems, federally mandated, because the exhaust system being part of the emission system has to last 100,000 miles. So steel tubing, mild steel mufflers went away and stainless steel replaced them, which does go 100,000 miles. And companies like Meineke were kind of out of business pretty quick. But this car got a fresh muffler back in when was the date on it? 2000. So 23 years ago, this car was in there for a new Meineke muffler. And uh, you just don't know what you're gonna find inside of cars. Now under the hood, a few different possibilities on these. The V6 was out of the picture for the Caprice Classic. These were strictly V8 powered, but which one? Well, we can learn by looking at this a few ways. Here's the emission sticker here. You see, look at this five liter. Okay, so this is the 307 or five. If that 57, it'd be a 350. But when you see the oil filler tube here, that's the Oldsmobile 307, which is not the same as a Chevy 305. The Olds 307 has a 3.8 inch bore and a 3.38 inch stroke. The Chevy 305 has a 3.7 inch bore and a 3.48 inch stroke. So a little bit longer stroke, a little bit uh, uh, smaller bore than the Olds 307. The difference in power is the Olds has 140 horsepower, 255 foot pounds. The Chevy has 150 horsepower, but 200. 40 foot-pounds. Now the 307 Oldsmobile always came with a Rochester Quadrajet, whereas the 305 Chevy could be had with a two-barrel, a four-barrel, or EFI. But that said, the Olds 307, a fine little engine introduced, I think, in 1980, and based on the 350, not a bad little engine at all. Uh, we see here 
This again is 1977, the new Chevrolet when they downsized. And again, the bones of this car go all the way back to 1977. And the new Chevrolet, a horizon, something changing. Here comes the new cars. Well, check this out. Here's the story on this. And we can see right there, a new, a lot of new thinking went in, a lot of new Chevy came out. And this is all about downsizing and aerodynamicizing, trim by the wind, corrosion fighters. And here on the right, it says a whole new wagon too. And again, it says here, more manageable in size than last year's Caprice and Impala wagons. And they're referring to, of course, the 76s. And here's more pictures. And again, they're, they look massive, don't they? But these are actually about 20% smaller and lighter than the 76s, which they replaced. And this catalog can that's the Impala wagon right there. The Caprice wagon, of course, is more loaded, but you could also get the Impala. And uh, there was actually a straight six possible in the Impala lineup, believe it or not. Not the V6, but a straight six in 77. Now, the Chevy that came before was the full-size puppy, this thing right here. And there it is, large and in charge. 1976, final year for this massive body-on-frame Chevy. You could even get a 454 toward the end. We see it right here, 454 in 1976. How cool is that? But again, one thing that's interesting is on the wagons, the rears are leaf springs. A lot of people don't realize that the, the hard tops, the convertibles have coils in the back, but wagons, full-size Chevy wagons up till 76 have leaf springs in the back because they're able to pull as much as 7,000 pounds, which is a three and a half tons. And these ones here, they pull about 6,000 pounds, a little smaller, a little lighter, but again, 6,000 pounds is still a lot more than a Chevy Celebrity Eurosport wagon could pull maybe 2,000. So if you had a family and you needed to pull a car, you needed a full-size Chevy like this, even though it was a downsized full-sized Chevy. Now, this platform lived on and kind, kind of controversially. Here's 1991, the first year for the redesign. Some people call it the Orca, but there we have it. Now, you can see the rear wheel openings are kind of weird. You know, they're kind of squashed down, and they only went a couple years like that, but the wagon was also available with that weird Orca body style. And again, the uh, 1991 up aerodynamic body, but again, the same basic bones as 1977. Why mess with a good thing? And these could be had with all the way up to the 260 horsepower LT1 350 toward the end, which was a whole lot more power than this. But again, Detroit sort of reeled and went down into a valley and kind of crawled back out. But again, the American full-size station wagon, very much a thing of beauty and in demand. And the headlights on these, this is the second gen nose. And unlike modern cars, which this would be plastic and frosty, this is glass. How cool is that? You know, these are now, the problem with modern flush lights like this is they frost, they turn white and you lose most of your, uh, they become opaque and you end up losing 30% of your, your light illumination at night time, they kind of suck. But glass ones like this are stock on all these. I think 1987, I think was the first year that they got away from the sunken quad lights. And all of this was in the name of making air not get sucked into that pocket and allowing these things to be more fuel efficient with better aer aer aerodynamics. So let's walk around this side. And uh, it's interesting to see a, a Hudson from the 1950s and what a radically different time. Uh, only 30 years difference between this and this here. But again, you like the sport mirrors on the Caprice Classic Estate right here. And these also are aerodynamic. They cut through the wind very gently. And I'm not sure, but they look kind of like they also are shared by Camaro and Firebird. Not certain, but the styling is certainly the same. It wouldn't be surprised to me if the part number was the same. I may be wrong there. But this does have the optional roof rack. Uh, again, if you load your car with your eight-person family and you load all your baggage and luggage and your car is full, you can still put stuff up on the roof. Extra cost. And again, the rub strips here prevent the baggage from marring your roof. And again, just an American classic family car feature right here. The Griswolds heading off to Wally World in their big full-size wagon. Of course, theirs was uh, not a Chevy, it was a Ford. Actually, it wasn't a Ford, it was a, a fake car with the, uh, uh, the, the Grundy Mobile, whatever that thing was. But anyway, classic American stuff, man. How many families, vacations, load up the whole family, hit the road with a car like this? Millions of them, for sure. And here's the air deflector on the back of that roof rack right here which did two things. It kept air moving over the back glass so it wouldn't stain as readily. And it also, I guess, helped to keep exhaust fumes from getting inside if you drove the car with the window down, which you could do. Uh, and speaking of uh, gasoline and exhaust, these run strictly on unleaded fuel. Here's the sticker right here, unleaded fuel only because the catalytic converter in these things would become poisoned if you ran anything other than unleaded. Looking inside, you'll see right here the plastic cap and something inside of here 
there's a little flapper, that thing right there, that arrived in the mid 70s to prevent you from putting the larger nozzle of the leaded fuel at the gas station into this and advertently or inadvertently poisoning your catalytic converter. But the, if, if nothing else, uh, making more exhaust emissions than Uncle Sam wanted you to make. So anyway, the, uh, the smog 70s extended into the 80s. And again, the downsizing thing, was a good thing for Detroit. It forced them into more efficient design and execution, which when you finally add some power becomes a win-win. But there were some dark days indeed where Detroit was fighting an uphill battle, trying to make the car smaller, cleaner, more fuel efficient. But the big size Chevy wagons like this were one of the last holdouts of the classic American rear-wheel drive full-sized wagon. And so that's the story of Chevy's full-size rear-wheel drive wagon, the last of the breed. Frankly, these were replaced by SUVs, which kind of do everything a little better, except they're not as fuel efficient. Uh, but again, you get what you pay for. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mag's YouTube channel. Subscribe, of course, and uh, ring the bell so you know when the next video hits, which is tomorrow morning.